Hi, welcome to the Sirius Security Seminar. Today we have Peter Stevenson of NetEdgy Corporation. Peter is the Director of Technology uh, for the Global Security Practice of NetEdgy. He's been in technology-related positions for about 35 years now. He's operated his own consulting practice for about 15 years. He's the author of 13 books on computer topics, and most recent of which is investigating computer-related crime. Um, he's contributed to over 400 articles and trade publications. He is also currently a PhD student at Oxford Brookes University in Oxford, England. And so, welcome, Peter. Thank you. Um, we're going to start out with uh, uh, a number of issues that have to do with information security, information protection, most especially investigation and uh, forensics. Normally, I, I like to take questions as we go, but we have some limitations on time today, and so what, what I'd rather do in this particular case is hold the questions until the end. I'll, I'll try to make some time for them. Uh, our agenda today is we'll begin with some background issues. Uh, investigating computer security incidents is heavily dependent upon some enabling laws, and so we'll spend a little time discussing uh, the legal actions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about criminal profiling because the investigation of a computer security incident goes beyond technology. And then we'll discuss some investigative issues that are specific to computer-related crime, and we'll wrap up with a discussion of forensics. Let's start out by understanding what it is we're talking about when we talk about computer-related crime. The FBI defines computer crime as crimes against a computer. In other words, a crime where the victim is the computer. We also have crimes where the computer contains evidence of another crime. This is considered to be a traditional crime where the computer is simply involved. An example of that would be fraud, where the fraudster has stored uh, information that leads to the discovery of his fraud on his computer. He may do something to protect it, such as encrypt it or try to hide it in, in a uh, so-called invisible directory, which I'm sure all of us know there is no such thing. The bad guys don't generally know that. It makes our job easier. And we have crimes where the computer is used to commit the crime, where the computer is actually the attack machine. And we've discovered through a number of surveys uh, that the average loss from a computer incident within industry is something around a million dollars. So this is serious business. Now, the modern computer criminal is motivated today by financial gain, political gain, or perhaps some form of revenge. The traditional hacker is becoming more and more rare. The computer underground now consists more of what we refer to as script kiddies, and I'm sure nobody here understands that term, so I'll, I'll just sort of leave it to you. I, I see smiles. Does, that you, doesn't mean you're script kiddies in here. Certainly not. Accomplished hackers. And what we're more concerned about is we're concerned about the motivated, skilled computer criminal. The script kitty is going to be fairly easy to, to protect against. The forensics involved with uh, an attack that's scripted, uh, especially if the script is, is a fairly common one, uh, the forensics in, involved with that are, are rather simplistic. The problems we have are those incidents where we find find ourselves dealing with somebody who is a skilled and determined attacker. Now, we find that those people tend to be accomplished code writers. They generally uh, create their own toolkits, their own attack kits. This is bad news for us forensically because when we're dealing with, uh, with a scripted attack that comes from uh, a script that's readily available on the internet, it's very easy for us to develop profiles of those scripts and forensically search for them. It's very simple to do. Keyword searches for the code are, are, are easy to accomplish uh, and when we're doing a, a forensic analysis of a computer disk. So 
when we're dealing with an individual who has scripted his or her own attack, then that attack is going to be more difficult to search for because we don't know what to look for. So that's a little bit more difficult. Most of these individuals that we're concerned with are out to steal from you or damage you in some way. 71% of the time that person is an insider within your organization. Now the internet gets all the sizzle. All the cool stuff happens on the internet. The bad guys come in, break down firewalls. Kevin Mitnick attacks and steals credit cards and the press goes wild. In reality, we're more concerned about the quiet attacker inside the organization who's doing some sort of damage or theft or fraud. And from my experience, probably more than 70% of the investigations that I'm involved in involve that kind of an individual. Now, here are some examples that right now I have teams working on. We had a situation where uh, a company that did online business uh, discovered that somebody was had broken into one of their servers, one of their web servers, had downloaded 900 credit card numbers a day before for several days before they discovered it. Then they began to get email from this individual saying, I know that you have a security hole and I can help you fix it. And don't you think that you ought to pay me if I'm going to help you fix this security hole? And oh, by the way, you'll probably lose some more credit card numbers every day until we come to some sort of an arrangement. One of my team members developed a, a sophisticated search tool that he calls a hunter seeker. Using the hunter seeker, we tracked this. We tracked it to a credit card theft ring in Lithuania that had a number of, of sites within the United States. They downloaded 900 cards a day and they sell from this one particular site and they sell and they trade those cards. They'll, uh, they'll trade you uh, 100 regular credit cards for 50 platinum cards, for example. We had a script kitty in the Netherlands who attempted to penetrate a Fortune 100 company and steal passwords. Uh, he was using a cable modem and we traced him back to the Netherlands and his uh, ISP, which is at home, uh, did not have an acceptable use policy in the Netherlands that prohibited this. So he broke no law, he penetrated, attempted to penetrate the company, the victim had no firewall. We had an internal employee uh, at a power company who crashed a SCADA system. For those of you who aren't familiar with SCADA systems, those are supervisory control systems for power companies. They control uh, power generating plants, power switching plants, that type of, of uh, facility. And in this particular case, uh, he trashed the SCADA system over a long weekend, which of course uh, had some potential for some real problems. Had there been, and this was over 4th of July weekend, so it was pretty warm, had there been brownouts, the plant that was being covered by that SCADA system would not have been able to respond. So those are some of the ideas that we have to deal with. These are the kinds of, of individuals who will be tracing their, their actions either backwards over the internet or forensically on a particular machine. Now, the bad guys get their information exactly the same way that any criminal gets their information. They observe events and equipment. They use public information. We did a penetration uh, probably five years ago on a, on a client and this, you have to bear in mind the state of the internet five years ago was nowhere near what the state of the internet is now from a commercial standpoint especially. So we did a penetration. First thing we did was do a search on the client company. We found over 5,000 pieces of information on the internet. And of those 5,000 pieces of information, one of them was a full network drawing of their network, which included such things as operating systems, network environments, IP addresses, where inter-networking devices such as routers were located, 
And all of this was on a single drawing on the internet. And was it the clients? No. It was a vendor who had sold them some products and wanted the world to see how they'd sold these products to this client. Obviously, armed with that information penetrating that system was a cakewalk. They also uh, still do dumpster diving. Dumpster diving is an old and honorable uh, penetration technique and people make it easy for the bad guys to dumpster dive. We had a client that was a bank. The bank decided that it would be a good thing if they kept all customer information separate in the branches from all other trash. So when you go in and you make out a deposit slip and you throw away the carbon copy, they were getting all those together and putting them in a blue bag. Blue because they wanted to make sure they kept them separate. Then they hired a company to come and collect the blue bags and dispose of all this sensitive customer information. The problem was that the company that was doing the pickups couldn't make the pickups until after 8 o'clock at night. By then the branch is closed. So the bank simply took the blue bags and set them outside the back door of the bank where the company could drive by and pick up the bag full of customer deposit slips. So our, our, our clients make it easy for the bad guys to be successful. Compromising systems. An effective intruder will generally do everything that they can do to avoid a direct hardcore attack against the system. Why? Because that direct hardcore attack has the effect of triggering alarms, which is what they don't want to do. So they'll do everything they can do to avoid that. And what does that mean? They want to harvest passwords in any way they can. If they harvest passwords, then they can go in as a legitimate user and perhaps slip in masquerading and not be noticed. Only an unskilled attacker will do something early in the attack that may trigger an alarm. And of course, the main hack that we run into is social engineering. This is, this is not low tech, this is no tech. This is simply convincing people that they need to do something for you that they shouldn't do. Predominantly, our bad guys want passwords. On your screen, you see now the top 10 vulnerabilities that we find typically within networks that, that we look at that have been compromised. Notice the top three. These are, uh, these are vulnerabilities that are, are fairly easy to defend against. Most systems have ways of defending if we, if we configure them properly against denial of service. Most organizations have ways of improving the strength of accounts. In other words, we want to make sure that the accounts are not only configured correctly, but we want to ensure that those accounts have appropriate passwords. And of course, there's the ever popular Microsoft Internet Information Server. By all accounts, absolutely riddled with security holes. Truth of the matter is, it's configurable you can work around most of them. And a little help from a firewall wouldn't hurt either. So these are top 10 vulnerabilities. When we go to investigate a security incident, we look at whether or not these vulnerabilities could have been exploited. Now I'm gonna make your lives easier. There are only four kinds of attacks that you have to be concerned about, only four. The first one is denial of service. The second one is social engineering. The third one is what I refer to as a technical attack, which is what the bad guys and the good hackers, there is such a thing by the by. I come from the old school where hacker was a good thing to say about somebody, not, and that was long before the press decided to turn it into a dirty word. They call them sploits or exploits. And then they're sniffing.
Sniffing is a very serious potential problem because it's very, very difficult to detect and it's almost impossible to detect with absolute certainty. There are ways to detect that the network or a device might be available for sniffing or might be have the propensity to house a sniffer, but that doesn't mean the sniffer's there. Some techniques that our bad guys use, the most <coughs> popular is to try to masquerade as a legitimate user. Social engineering is a major technique. Any method of harvesting passwords. We need to figure out when we begin an investigation whether or not there's been an effort to harvest passwords. If we're looking at the attack machine, we can forensically recover password lists. For example, let's imagine that an attacker is trying to penetrate a Unix machine. The attacker manages to get to a point where they can download, using whatever kind of exploit, they can download the password file. So they download the password file. If they're on a DOS-based computer, NT, Windows, whatever, if they're on a DOS-based computer, or if they're on an Intel based Unix computer, Linux, FreeBSD, SCO, that type of, of operating system. The minute they download that password file, it's going to be on that computer's hard drive. And unless they overwrite it, if they simply delete it, we can find it forensically. So we always look on the attack machine for remnants of uh, a password file and system masquerades. A popular way of uh, subverting a website is to actually not subvert the website but subvert the name server. You attack the name server, you point that website back at your machine and you intercept everything that comes from that machine. Any good attacker is going to attempt to clean up after the attack. They're going to delete tools and work files. They'll modify their logs. Here in the list are some Unix logs that they might attempt to modify. Some are easy to modify. Some require special tools. Most Unix logs are simply text files. Uh, the, um, the, the exception to that is the last log. And that may be a text file if the, uh, if the system operator has the machine set up to create a simple text file, but normally it's created on the fly. The two logs that create it are not simple text files. They require a tool to modify. The tool is readily available, so there's no problem with modifying those. Uh, and any uh, good attacker is going to attempt to do that. There is now a tool that we can use to modify NT logs. Uh, the person who put the tool out said, don't worry, you've got to be administrator to run it. Well, yeah. <laughs> if I've compromised the machine and I've got an administrator, what's the first thing I want to do before I leave? Modify the log. And that's what they, that's what they do. When you're investigating, this is an axiom that, that I believe strongly in, as you're going to see shortly why. Treat every incident as though it's going to end up in a criminal prosecution. 99% won't. Hacking for hire is a low risk, high growth job opportunity. Because such a very, very, very small percentage of hackers for hire either get caught or if they're caught they don't get prosecuted. However, there are evidence gathering issues that you need to be aware of and we're going to talk about those shortly. If you maintain the standards of a criminal investigation, then you'll never have a problem with the way you collected and preserved your evidence. 
Okay, there are three basic standards for our investigations. First of all, there are criminal investigations. You have to establish your case beyond a reasonable doubt. There are formal rules of evidence, and the finder of fact is a jury usually. Civil, which tends to be far more contentious than criminal because there's lots of money involved. That type of, of investigation, you'll need to establish your case based on the preponderance of the evidence which means more than 50 percent. Rules of evidence apply, the proceedings are formal, we can have either a judge or a jury. And administrative uh, investigations are such things as union actions, terminations, that type of thing, arbitrations, and in those cases, generally the case is, is established on the preponderance of the evidence, proceedings are informal, and we could have arbitrators, mediators, or other finders of fact that would be involved in making a decision. They can become extremely contentious, and there generally are very few rules. Okay, the laws that you need to deal with, and this is important, if you go into private company to conduct an investigation even at that company's request and we're not talking about law enforcement now we're talking specifically about going into a private company as a consultant or an investigator which is one of the things that I do if that company doesn't have very explicit privacy policies that state that the employees do not have an expectation of privacy it's better not to conduct the investigation because the information that you're going to take from the hard drives of, of the system are going to violate the individual's privacy rights. Now there's a way around that and the way around that is through the Electronic Communications Privacy Act and that basically says that the owner of a system may intercept communications between an intruder and the owner's system. So what that means is that if I decide to intercept communications, put a sniffer, for example, on my perimeter network, out where the firewall is, where the web servers live, that touches the public internet, then I can do that and I don't need anybody's permission to do it if I own the system. So that's the first piece of good news. You can also make routine backups and perform other routine monitoring. You may intercept with the consent of the owner of the data. Okay? The owner of the data is not, if you have a proper policy, is not necessarily the user of the computer. If the policy says that all data on company computers belong to the company, and that the company can monitor and intercept anything on that network and if the employee acknowledges that in writing that constitutes prior consent and this is a typical policy approach you can also intercept where it's necessary to protect your rights or property this is a difficult judgment to make and the reason it's a difficult judgment to make is because you say you're protecting your rights or property, but remember, these things get decided in court. And the decision is not only made, not always made, based upon facts, it may be made based upon lawyering. The attorney that's able to convince the jury is the one that wins the case. And the facts may or may not have anything to do with it. Now the Privacy Protection Act is an act that's generally quoted as being something that, that protects you and protects your privacy. The fact of the matter is that it covers materials intended for publication. So in most cases the Privacy Protection Act is of no use to you. The Fourth Amendment, as we all know, is protection against unreasonable search and seizure. It applies to law enforcement. It doesn't apply to private parties acting on behalf of their organizations. Okay? There is an exception, and the exception is when you're acting as an agent of law enforcement. This is a matter of timing. These three things need to occur. First of all, you need to perform a search which the government would require a search warrant for. 
The second thing you have to do is perform the search to assist the government, in other words, the cops, as opposed to, to furthering your own interests. And the government needs to be aware, law enforcement needs to be aware, and doesn't object. In other words, they accept, they accept your assistance. Now, this is a matter of timing. This is a matter of when you notify law enforcement as relates to when you conduct your investigation. So, for example, let's say that um, I've had a suspicion that one of my employees has had their hand in the cookie jar and I think I can get evidence of this on their computer. And so I pick up the phone and I call the FBI and I say, Agent Scully, I think that my employee has had their hand in the cookie jar. I want you to come, seize their computer and examine it because I think you're going to find they've broken the law. Well, Agent Scully will very probably, if she doesn't put me in, a, in one of those funny white coats, you know, the ones that your arms cross, she'll tell me no. Why? She doesn't have probable cause. I haven't given her a reason for doing this, and she'll refuse. She'll say something, I don't have probable cause, I need to get a search warrant, I can't get a search warrant without probable cause. Well, being the clever gent that I am, I go back to my office and I say, I'm going to wait. And this weekend, I'm going to check that computer. I'll give her probable cause. And I do, and by golly, I find that my employee is guilty. Find all sorts of evidence. I call her back. Can she take the case? No. I've done her job for her. She told me she needed probable cause. I said, I'll get you probable cause. I go and get her probable cause. It's too late. I've done her job. I would have needed a warrant. If, on the other hand, I did my investigation first and then called the FBI, we'd be all right. Because I'm, at that point, furthering my own interests, not acting as an agent of law enforcement. Okay, we've got some rules of evidence we have to deal with. The first one is the hearsay rule. It's not a problem anymore. Used to be. Used to be that, that all computer evidence was considered to be hearsay because it's not in its original format. <laughs> original formats, bits and bytes inside, you know, electrical impulses inside a computer. <coughs> it's been translated into something that human beings can read when we read out that log. It's not a problem anymore. You can expect to be challenged on logs, but if you can explain in detail how the log was collected, that it has, how it has not been modified and why you know that to be, be the case and what the custody of the log has been falls under the business records rule and you won't have a problem. Second is the best evidence rule. The best evidence rule says that the evidence you present has to be the best example of that evidence available. Doesn't have to be the original evidence. For example, I can use a Xerox copy of a document as evidence if the document no longer exists and I have first-hand knowledge as to how the copy was made. The evidence must be probative. That means that it has to actually go towards proving the allegations. If I've got somebody that I believe is hacked into my computer, and I say, I know that that person hacked into my computer, and, and the, the cop says, how do you know that? And I say, because he wears glasses. That doesn't tell me anything. There's no connection. It's not probative. In a court, that wouldn't be allowed. It needs to be produced in the normal course of business. You can't begin logging the activities of an individual without some reason that goes before you begin the logging. For example, if I normally log this much information and in the course of logging that information I see activities by an individual, I can narrow my logging to the point where I focus on that individual. But if I'm not logging at all and I decide one day out of the blue to start logging a particular individual, especially if that individual is a minority, I can, I can be absolutely certain that I will have a lawsuit. It will be absolutely guaranteed. I have
have violated that person's rights. Not only have I violated that person's rights, there are all sorts of civil rights and civil liberties issues that go along with it. And I will probably, if convicted, spend some time in jail. So we do things as part of normal course of business when we produce logs. The information needs to be authentic, which means that it has to actually have been produced in, in the way that we represent that it was produced. And we have to maintain chain of custody. Chain of custody means that I can account for explicitly of my own knowledge the custody of a piece of evidence from the time I receive it to the time I give it to somebody else. And the whole chain of custody needs to account from the time that the evidence was collected until the time that it's used in court. Now, if you fail to meet those burdens, then everything that falls out of that evidence is what we call tainted fruit. And what that means is that if I go and make a bitstream backup of a hard drive, I'm collecting evidence at that point. And when I collect that evidence, if I collect it wrongly, I, I violate somebody's rights, uh, I violate chain of custody, something of this nature, everything that was part of that evidence is now useless to me. I can no longer use it. So our chain of custody accounts for access to the evidence from collection to presentation in court. And we have to have an evidence custodian. There may be several. I may give it to, to somebody in my office. They take custody of it. They give it to somebody who takes custody of it. Each step along the way, we log it, we sign for it, we date it. And we maintain that in a locked container. Now, one of the things that we can do to help us in our investigation is we can use techniques of criminal profiling. Criminal profiling was developed by the FBI to chase uh, criminals such as serial rapists, serial killers, individuals that have, th that their crimes are motivated by deep psychological aberrations. Now, nobody who does computer things has deep psychological aberrations, and so obviously that's not why we use criminal profiling. But there are reasons to use it. We can use crime scene analysis techniques from criminal profiling to discover such things as how access was obtained. What was the skill level required? Is this somebody running a kiddie script? Or is this a skilled intruder who manually hacks into the system? These are things that tell us things about the skill level of our attacker. How did the intruder behave on the system? Were they like a bull in a china shop or did they seem to know exactly where they were going? Maybe they had inside information. We can also look at how they clean up. Did they get their tools out of there or did they use some trivial method such as on a Unix machine creating a dot directory and putting stuff in it and saying well that's hidden nobody can see it now. We can also use the investigative psychology piece of profiling to understand motivation. Nobody does anything without a reason. We may not understand the reason. We may not agree with the reason. It may make no sense to us. But to the person who did that thing, there was a reason. And that reason is why they've committed the act. We need to understand that. We also need to look at personality types. There is no such thing as a stereotyped hacker. Hacker can be anybody. It can be somebody with a high skill level who has absolutely no negative motivations at all. I've got a couple of those that work for me that are absolutely first rate and some of the most ethical people I've ever met. Or the person can be, can be of a criminal mindset. Understanding the personality type helps us understand what to look for when we examine their computer forensically. Now we've got some goals 
in our investigation. The first goal is to ensure that all applicable logs and evidence are preserved. That's a primary goal and we have to do that fast. Evidence on computers and in the, on the internet is very, very fragile. It gets overwritten, it gets deleted, <coughs> logs on the internet roll very rapidly. Chasing email through, through sites on the internet can be extremely difficult because the logs roll so rapidly in big email systems. So our number one objective is to preserve the evidence. We freeze time. Second one is to understand how the intruder is entering the system. We can't begin a backtrace if we don't understand how the intruder is entering our system. So that's critically important. The next thing is to obtain the information we may need to justify a trap and trace if the phone line is the means of entry. A trap and trace requires a warrant. A warrant requires a cop. A cop requires a judge. So we have to take a case to law enforcement that will allow that to occur. Can you get a trap and trace without, without a warrant? Absolutely. You pick up the phone and if it's your phone number, the phone company will put a trap and trace on it. But they won't tell you the results without the warrant. Now having said that, if you need to start a trap and trace, do it and get the warrant later because evidence is fragile and once it's captured you have time to go through the legal issues and gain access to the information. Capturing it is the key. We also want to know why the intruder chose the computer to attack. What's again the motivation? How did that happen? Is it a disgruntled employee trying to get even with their employer for something? Is it somebody stealing? What's the motivation? Why was it chosen? We need to gather as much evidence of the intrusion as we possibly can and we need to gather it early in the game. We want to obtain information that can narrow our list of suspects, document the damage because in many cases if this goes to law enforcement, law enforcement agencies will not investigate unless the loss exceeds a particular threshold. In many cities in the United States, large cities such as Los Angeles, the threshold for investigation of a computer related crime by the FBI is a half a million dollars of loss. So you need to document everything. And you need to gather enough information to decide if you even want to involve law enforcement. Okay. Your immediate objective then is preserve the evidence. Then the next thing we're going to do is begin a trace back to find intermediate places where logs might exist and get those logs frozen. This is difficult over the internet. Not difficult because we can't find them, difficult because these are systems outside of our control. We need the cooperation of the system administrator. Then we need to contact those system administrators on intermediate sites and get them to preserve the logs. You will probably have to subpoena those logs, but again, worry about that later. Get the logs preserved. Then you need to contain the damage to the victim, collect any local logs that you can find, and then we want to image the disks on victim computers. By imaging disks, I mean we're going to take a bitstream backup. And I'll talk to you about that in just a moment. When we arrive at a crime scene, the first thing we need to do is get everybody away from the computer under investigation. That could be the victim computer, it might be the suspect's computer, whatever it is, get people away from it. We want to look for communications connections and look for other connections and look at the screen display. Now don't walk up to the machine with a, with a screen saver on there and wiggle the mouse. We don't want to do that. The reason we don't want to do that is because we're going to dump information from the machine's buffers onto areas of the hard disk where they may cover up evidence. Leave the computer alone. Don't touch it. Don't go type on the keyboard. Don't do a DIR or on a Unix machine, an LS. Just leave it alone when you walk up to it. Unplug the communications connections from the computer. Don't turn anything off. One thing to be careful of. If 
you have a computer that's on a network, a PC that's on a network, and it's running DHCP, it might start hunting for the server. That means it's putting stuff on the disk. If you don't know how that computer is connected to the network, don't disconnect it from the network. Move very quickly to some of our next steps. We disconnect the modem from the telephone, and we document and label all the connections, and then we pull the plug. We don't turn it off, we don't do a graceful shutdown, we pull the plug. Now, we're talking about desktop computers here. Obviously, you don't walk up to an HP 9000 that's connected to 220 on the wall and pull the plug. You don't walk up to a computer that's running a terabyte of RAID 5 array and pull the plug. We have different techniques for that. But on desktop computers, pull the plug. Okay? Reboot from an external source. Usually what we'll do is we'll reboot from a DOS floppy. And the reason we do that is because we're going to run our forensics tools from that floppy. And if we reboot from the floppy, we won't even at the logical level be able to see the hard drive. But because our forensic software is going to make a bitstream backup at the physical level, it comes in under the interrupt, accesses the disk directly in read-only mode, and does what we need to have done. So we reboot from the A drive. Anything we do now on the keyboard, anything we do in terms of collecting forensic evidence will now put garbage on our A disk, our little floppy. It won't do anything to the C drive. When we're done, we shut down, collect our evidence, bag it and tag it, and put it into chain of custody. Okay, how do we develop an idea of how the crime occurred? First thing we do is we start with witness accounts. It's very important that immediately we get witness interviews going so that we know what happened, what was observed. What time did the system go down? When did you discover there was an attacker in the system? How did you know? What did you see? Did you see it in the log? Did some application fail to function? Next thing we need to do is consider how the intruder gained access. How did they get in? Eliminate the obvious. If it's absolutely clear they dialed in through a maintenance modem, there's no evidence that they came in over the internet, eliminate that for the time being. Focus on the maintenance modem for the moment. Use your logs, use physical evidence, use your witness accounts. And then the next thing we do is we bake the image, the bitstream backup. Now we can begin to develop a, a profile of the intruder. What's this intruder's skill level? How did they behave on the system? What appeared to be the motive for the attack? Consider how the attacker got into the computer. You may even have to recreate the incident in the lab to see if you get the same indications in the logs from your hypothesized attack as you might get in the real attack. So I've got a set of logs. I think that the attack went this way. I'll put the computer into my lab. I'll attack it and see if the logs match. Always consider alternative explanations, always, because you'll find that almost half the time that you think a computer has been hacked, it hasn't. What you're actually seeing may be buggy software. This is especially true with NT. You may, you may see user errors. You may see a failing machine. Any number of things it may not be an attack at all. When we backtrace, the elements of the backtrace are the endpoints of the trace, in other words, the source and destination. Any intermediate systems and email or packet headers. Also, we're interested in logs. Our objective is to backtrace to a point of presence. Typically, that point of presence is going to have some sort of logging associated with it because it's usually a telco or an internet service provider or a cable provider. These are places where you may be able to associate an IP address with an account. If you can't, 
then you need to keep going backwards until you can because obviously this has been used as an intermediate point. So that's our objective. And remember that the only things that you can't backtrace are things that have used a true anonymizer. And I'm not talking about the idiot that uses Yahoo Mail and, and thinks he's anonymous. I'm talking about people who are using true encrypting anonymizers, such as Mixmaster. I said that there are times when we need to obtain subpoenas. The difference between a subpoena and a warrant is a warrant is issued by a judge pursuant to a crime and an ongoing investigation or a suspected crime and an ongoing investigation. A subpoena on the other hand can be issued by a lawyer. That subpoena is issued pursuant to an ongoing case, a lawsuit of some sort. There are also subpoenas that can be issued in criminal cases. So. The problem we have is that in order to issue a subpoena in a lawsuit, we have to be suing somebody. But if we don't know who the attacker is, we can't sue them. So presumably we can't issue a subpoena in a lawsuit that we can't create because we can't sue somebody. It's a vicious circle, but it's not. As it turns out, we can file what's called a John Jane Doe lawsuit. This is a technique that was developed by attorneys who were dealing with hit and run accidents where they needed to gather evidence of the hit and run but they needed a lawsuit in place in order to do it, in order to subpoena records. Same thing here. So we file a John Jane Doe lawsuit, we get an emergency order to subpoena appropriate records from service providers, from telcos, and we do that. We subpoena the logs we need. But remember, before you do that, the minute you've identified an intermediate log point, contact the security officer in that organization and have them preserve the logs. They will almost always cooperate with you. All right, we've got a lot of log information in Unix and, and I'm going to just sort of zip through this in a hurry. The reason that I put the cron log on there, this is something that's generally missed by intruders. They'll go in and clean up a lot of logs, but the cron log will clearly show when the machine's been rebooted. And very often one of the tricks that an intruder will use to cover their tracks is to force a reboot of a Unix machine after they've killed the logs and killed the demons that, that are logging like syslog. They can kill that, delete portions of the log, force a reboot or panic the machine and cause the machine then to restart. It, re it starts the logging again, there's a gap in the logs and they're invisible. The most that the system administrator can see is that something happened and some, there's a gap in the logs. So maybe he was attacked, but he knows nothing about it. He has no information, no details. So the cron log can help us find what times these reboots have occurred. And the reason that we use the cron log is because the bad guys usually forget to clean that one up. Not because it's any special log, just because very often we're dealing with dummies. You may have other logs from things like TCP wrappers that can be useful to you. Remember, once a machine's compromised, the logs are not reliable. You can't guarantee that what you're seeing is what actually happened. NT, NT logs can now be modified as well. Web servers can help you a great deal in certain kinds of traces. When we're tracing email, for example, much email that comes from sites like Yahoo Mail and Hotmail is entered through not an email system, but through an HTML uh, form. So we can use that information in the HTTP access log to begin a, a traceback. Okay? Remember that if we're going to use logs as evidence, we're going to have to explain why they weren't modifiable. Be careful of that one because they most always are and they need to be complete. Sometimes we have to analyze logs and there aren't any logs. Well, there's two ways, two reasons why there might not be any logs. One reason may be that the logs were never created. 
No amount of magic is going to bring those logs back. If they were never created, they're not there, you can't use them. But in some systems, if the attacker erased the logs or part of the logs, we may be able to forensically recover them. We can also analyze multiple logs from multiple systems for corroboration and to fill in gaps. Okay, the concept of forensics is a fuzzy one. We've been touching on forensics for about the last 10 minutes, so let's really dive into it. We have basically uh, three kinds of forensics. One is uh, basic forensic computer science. That deals with ambient data on disks. Operational forensics lets us use that information to recover a system that's been attacked or damaged. And network forensics is backtracing. Now here at Purdue, you've also done some good work on a fourth kind of forensics, which is software forensics, which deals with who wrote the code. Forensic examination allows us to extract information from hidden areas of disks. And those hidden areas basically are areas which are not readily accessible using the computer's file system. And we use it to develop leads, verify hypotheses, and recover damaged systems. It plays the role of physical evidence. And we can develop leads using forensic evidence to find out whether there's a connection between the victim computer and the attack computer. The example I gave to you earlier about finding uh, remnants of a password file on an attack computer is an example of making that connection. We can use, use it to see if the attacker accessed the victim computer. We may find uh, evidence of telnet sessions, passwords on the attack computer we can find out with whom the suspect may have communicated by finding remnants of email. You're not usually going to solve your case with forensics. Smoking guns are very rare. Usually forensics is just part of an overall investigation. We use it for generating leads and corroborating other facts. When we collect evidence, we need to collect all records of any unauthorized use we want to make sure those records are kept safe and don't use the internet and email to communicate about the intrusion because you're probably being watched. And if you doubt that, go into some of the uh, underground chat rooms and listen to the, the denizens of those chat rooms discussing how they knew what a particular system administrator was going to do before they did it because they intercepted his email. Also, you want all records of system activity on the day of the access, not just at the access time. Most attacks are preceded by some probing. Get your backups. Make your, uh, make your physical backup. We use a couple of tools to do that. One is called SafeBack. Uh, another one is called Encase. And never work directly on the computer. Always collect your evidence and work on a copy of it because the disk on the computer is the original evidence. Okay. Your objective is to preserve the crime scene from alteration, document everything, and if you seize the whole PC, which I almost never do anymore, I usually seize the disk, keep it from booting. Okay. We have two kinds of backups, logical and physical. The logical ones are files that are reported by the file system. Physical is actually a bitstream transfer of the data on the disk. That includes data you can't see using the file system. That's the stuff we want. When you select your forensic tools, you want to make sure that they don't alter data as a side effect of the collection process. They need to collect only what you want. They need to be able to, you need to be able to establish that they worked as advertised and they should be readily accepted by the forensic community. It makes it much easier to use the evidence in a court. Otherwise you get to explain why you're sure it works. None of you want to do that, believe me. Okay. Evidence hides, I've, I've spoken about ambient data, it hides in slack space and unallocated space. Unallocated space comes in two flavors. 
One flavor is true unallocated space, that's virgin space on the disk where nothing has ever been written. The rest is deleted file space. This is space that's been filled by files that have been deleted or erased or remnants or fragments of those files and data. Swap files and cache files. This is where we look for our evidence. Okay? Just to set some levels, we know that uh, disk geometry is made up of tracks, cylinders, and sectors. Sectors, groups of sectors make up clusters. In forensics, we generally talk in terms of clusters. And slack space is the space between the end of the file and the end of the last cluster in that file. Buffers drop into slack space. When I close a program, I close a document, anything that's in buffers will try to drop onto the hard disk and generally speaking will end up in slack space. It may in Windows end up in the swap file. Okay. Only physical backups are useful. It's not of any use to us to do a logical backup because what we want is probably, there's been an effort to erase it and it's probably in slack space or unallocated space, maybe in a swap file we can actually scan the backups for information using the tools that we use or we can restore the backup to a test disk and have an image of the original disk and we can work on that image never 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 work on the original evidence okay? so how do we back up we boot from a floppy to DOS and then we run our tool we back up to a device such as a jazz disk a CD takes lots of CDs on most most large disks today or DVD we use DVDs or we can do a direct disk to disk copy be careful when you do that by the way it's a career limiting move to do it backwards and end up copying a nice clean drive on top of your evidence and I've seen I've seen that done okay when we're developing leads we have a number of tools that we can use uh, there's a list of these tools here. Basically what we're doing is we're doing keyword searches at the physical level of the disk. That will get everything that we can see logically, but it was all, will also get things that were attempted to be erased. So here's step by step. We shut down the computer, reboot with the floppy. We can use file list to get a listing of all of the files. After we've made our image, we make the image first, then we do the file list. This gives us a complete list of every file, a file and directory inventory of the disk, and it matches that. Each file, it matches with uh, a CRC and an MD5 hash. So we can tell if the disk has been changed sometime in the future. We want to cryptographically sign evidence and encrypt it and put it into chain of custody. Extract the evidence using tools that we can use to read that information and we can run our text searches. Preserve the evidence. Remember we talked about chain of custody. This is critical. Never perform evidence, uh, never perform tests on your evidence. Always use images. And never operate a computer that contains possible evidence. Just remember that computer-related crime and investigation is job security for all of us. Uh, we have two minutes and nine seconds for questions. <laughs> and I'm, I'm out of breath from, making, from putting 10 pounds of potatoes in a five-pound sack here. So I'm open for questions. Yes, sir. So do you generally discard anything that's running in the process space when you are called in to do an investigation? <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, the, the problem that you have... Could you repeat that question? <laughs> just for the... Could, could the instructor please repeat the question just for those who might not have heard it? The instructor certainly can. Um, do you just discard or disregard anything that's running in the process space when you come in to examine a computer? And it's a good question because it may or may not be relevant. For example, if I come in and I have a, a Unix computer that I'm investigating and the attack is in process or just completed, there's a very good possibility that there'll be useful information in memory. And I can get that information 
by causing the computer to dump core. But if I do that, I'm probably going to overwrite something on the disk, maybe something I want. So I have to weigh that. If that attack was in process, dumping core may get me everything I need. So it may be worth it. On the other hand, if I walk in and the attack occurred six weeks ago, there's probably nothing in there that's of any use. It's a trade-off. You have to look at the situation and decide where your value is likely to be. I got time for maybe one more. Yes, sir. Oh, I read one FBI document once that, like, for digital photographs, that the company they do may have to reveal their source code um, to prove that the image is authentic. Is that true for forensic software as well? That if you use a closed source software, that the court could say, you know, to the vendor. The, the the question has to do with whether we have to explain how the source code works to court to a court of the tools that we use to collect evidence such as the forensics evidence or perhaps um, tools that created digital photographs and the answer is if you go back to my slide where we talked about um, we talked about the criteria for forensic tools one of the criteria is general use by the uh, forensics community if you stick to those tools the answer is no and today there are even ways to avoid having to do it with digital photographs depending upon what you present as evidence for example uh, we put the chip that the memory chip that we use in our digital cameras we put it itself into evidence That's weird. And, and even though yes there are ways that you can put that into a PC and alter it again it comes down to your testimony you testify you didn't do that this is the original chip this is like the original hard drive and you can use it as evidence so you stick to things and processes that have been used in court and you won't have to describe them in in bit and bite detail always try to avoid that the defense will try to get you to do it because it will guaranteed uh, confuse the jury and that's what they want to do avoid it at all costs we are done I want to thank you for joining me. Uh, it was an interesting session, and I understand the slides are available uh, on the Sirius site.